this is the route the riders face today and what is the 103rd edition of the last French Classic of the year between Paris and Tours actually starting for the first time from the city of Chartres and heading down to the traditional finish for the last 21 years in Tours and last year's winner Philippe Gilbert hoping he can match that to Tom Bowen here as well he's never had a podium finish here as he now awaits and thinks possibly of taking out the sprint a distance overall of uh, over 200 uh, kilometres and slightly shorter than previous years. I'm Phil Liggett, alongside me is Paul Show, and you've ridden this race, Paul. It's a long way at this time of the year, but it is flat. It certainly is. A sting in the tail for the riders too, Phil, with three very nasty climbs down towards the end, and those are the climbs that will be used by the, the baroudeurs, the attackers of the race, to try and get away from the sprinters. It is ideally made, this race, for the sprinters, but on occasions they have been outwitted by the men who are prepared to attack either very early on in the race or in the last five to ten kilometres. Well, as we uh, start our coverage now, I can tell you there are 10 riders clear of the field. And these 10 riders getting away 9 kilometres into the race today. And at 54 kilometres, they had a lead of 5 minutes. We're now looking at the action here. This is Jonathan Tira of the Aubervilliers 93 team. He's a, a young Frenchman, third-year professional. He's had one win this year and he's part of the leading group and it looks at last as they're within the last 55 kilometers to the finish and the gap is down to just 228 that they are starting to fall out with one another now. Well they built up that maximum advantage of seven minutes and 40 seconds but I think the sprinters feel today really do want to have their day and they never really let that breakaway group get itself up to massive proportions of 10 or 15 minutes they always kept them in what they felt was a reasonable distance a distance that could be pulled back down towards the end but I'm certain that riders like Philippe Gilbert and Pippo Pozzato the Italian national champion will be looking to try and get out of the pack on the run in towards the finish and come down onto the this great uh, boulevard, the Avenue de Grammont, for probably what is going to be the last time as next year this uh, boulevard is going to get ripped up and turned into a tramway. Yes, yeah, so a slice of cycling tradition will go with it, I'm afraid, because the road will then be too narrow to finish this sprinter's race uh, along this 2.6 kilometre dead straight road. It is the longest finishing straight in the world of cycling and sadly looks like disappearing after this race this year. There's just a slight chance that building work will be behind schedule next year. We might come back here, but basically the organisers pretty much resigned to finding a new finish here in the city of Tor. The race, it seems, will stay here in Tor, though. And so, uh, 21st time, it'll come up that straight today. The Tour de France has also used it in the past, where Tom Bonin has won a stage here. And uh, since then, Bonin trying at last to win, to win Paris Tour, which he's never done. Now, a lot of the work has been done here by the riders with the orange tops to their jerseys, Paul, the Garmin Slipstream team from the USA, simply because they feel they've got the winner if they can bring it all together in Tyler Farrer. Well, he's been so successful, Phil, in the latter part of this season. He was extremely successful at the Tour de France if you take away the performances of the British rider, Mark Cavendish, who ended his season recently at the Tour of Missouri, going down with a chest infection because Cavendish, uh, on a number of occasions, just getting the better of Tyler Farrar, pushing him down into second and third places on stages of the tour. Could well be too that the uh, peloton has learned its lesson over these last few years because it hasn't been a race for the sprinters. The sprinters have not had the chance to race for first place as was the case last year when Philippe Gilbert uh, just reached a leading group in the last few kilometres and left them to win the race by a scant five seconds on the line. Tyler Farrar in fifth place was the Monsieur, best of the sprinters, uh, uh, sweeping up from the main field. But the breakaway succeeding uh, on that occasion. But this time it looks as though the field is chasing them down that little bit earlier. This is Tier. He's a pretty much unknown to us, a third-year professional. He's not on the big team. He's on a French uh, team, which has been brought into the race, naturally enough, a French organised classic. And uh, of the 25 teams, one or two teams that we don't normally see at this level have got teams in the event. Here's the full lineup of the breakaway for you. Damien Godin, Matt Heyman, Laszlo Bedrogi, Mathieu Ledanu, Martin Elmager, Cedric Pino, Adri Fierhouten, by the way, Fierhouten riding his last race as a pro. He retires today. Tom Vilas from the Skill Shimano team, Jean-Luc Delpech from the Britann team, and Jonathan Tira. That's the breakaway at the moment. Tira trying to go it alone. 
Well, I'm not sure why he's trying to go it alone. It's still a long way to go for the, to the finish, Phil, and most of the riders in this breakaway are well cooperating together. But I think it's more important to think about the final few kilometres because at eight kilometres to go in this race is a very nasty first climb, the Côte de l'Epont, followed uh, around about two or three kilometres later by the Côte de pont volant and then the Côte de petit Padan. And that's where, uh, in the past, a lot of the riders like Posato and uh, Gilbert have tried to get away and outwit the sprinters. I have a gut feeling, because this is probably going to be the last time the race finishes here on the Avenue de Grammont, the sprinters will certainly want to have their day, because this race is very much like for the climbers who dream about winning on the Alpe d'Huez, the sprinters dream about winning here on the Avenue de Grammont. You mentioned a little earlier about uh, the big Belgian champion, Tom Bonin, never having won Paris Tours, but he's actually won on this finishing straight in the past. That was on the stage of the Tour de France, and I'm sure he would like to round off his season with a victory here as well. As you can see, the clouds blowing in now, but it has been a marvellous day all over the Loire Valley today. Clear blue skies, but a little bit of rain looking as though it may be coming into the air now. As a pretty sight of the leading group of Paris Tours racing at a very high speed today. We're way up on schedule at the moment, nearly 90 kilometres covered in the opening two hours of this classic, leaving shot at around about 11.15 local time, scheduled to finish at 5 p.m., and they might well be inside that. But this breakaway at one stage had a lead of 7 minutes 40, and then I think with 130 kilometres to go, uh, that alarm bells started ringing. The chase did start, and it was started by Farrow's Garmin Slipstream team. And it looks, at, as we go back to the peloton here, there's a lot of riders now anxious. The blue jerseys there for Tom Bonin's team, that's quick step. And also Alan Davis in the field as well, the Australian, who could well finish off if Tom falls aside. There's Bonin, the black top in his national champion jersey of Belgium. Yeah, and of course, uh, let's not forget that we've seen a number of riders from uh, Silence Lotto fill at the front end of the main field, the team uh, of the, the world champion, Cadell Evans. And they're obviously working to try and pull that breakaway group back before we get to the small climbs towards the end for their man, Philippe Joubert, who got himself a, a very interesting victory just a couple of days ago, as did Andre Greipel, uh, the big sprinter from Team High Road Columbia. And I think everybody a little bit surprised to learn that Greipel was caught out in the crosswinds, uh, was in a group of riders around about 20 behind the main field, and he abandoned because he was one of the, the pre-race favourites, I'd have to say, after winning the recent Paris Bourges. Well, he's, he's on form. He's had 20 wins. He's coming up close to his the more infamous teammate, Mark Cavendish, who's had 23 wins this year. But Mark himself has now retired for the season. And Greipel was among the favourites today. He thought it would suit him this finish. But once you get caught out at the back of the field, they never regain the peloton. The result was there was only one place to go, and that was in the sag wagon, the last vehicle in the race and travelled by car. You can see the wind is still causing a little bit of problem here, judging by the front of the peloton, coming from the top left-hand corner of our picture. And again, Garmin Slipstream driving on the pace. Now, they're obviously extremely motivated, especially by the success of Tyler Farrarfield, because uh, since the end of the Tour de France, he's been extremely successful. And, of course, he won his first uh, Classic, and that was in August, uh, the Vatten 4 Classic, a race that used to be the Hamburg Grand Prix in Germany. And that was the first indication that he was going to have an incredible end to the season. Three stage victories in the Eneco Tour, which goes through Belgium and Holland. A stage victory in the Vuelta that he'd been chasing all the way through the month of July to try and get a Grand Tour stage victory. And then, of course, just recently, completely dominant in the franco Bells race, where he won the first two stages and the overall classification. Beautiful countryside here now as we head toward the Loire Valley. The Loire, the longest river in France. It just runs about 1,300 kilometres long, straight across the country. And Tours sits right on the river. And the field actually bypass Tours. They go south and they circumnavigate it and they come in over those series of small hills, which is rather a cruel finale. It usually destroys the breakaway's chances. Today it might create because the way they're chasing this downfall, 50 kilometres out, only a minute 45 before they're swept up. And there's going to be a different reaction to the bodies as well this year because the race is slightly shorter than it has been in previous years. They're down to 230 kilometres, the race, instead of 265 that it was last year. That's because of the new start in Chartres. And you may well see the riders like Gilbert and Pipo Podzata, the attackers, having that little bit more energy to open the gap on the running towards the finish. But for the sprinters, this is an ideal finishing straight. As you mentioned earlier, it's 2.6 kilometres. And that, in fact, creates a, a lot of errors by the sprinters who decide to start their sprint just a little bit too early because of nervousness and, of course, sometimes because of uh, a little bit of too much enthusiasm. 
Well, Katusha's uh, Laszlo Bedrogi here from Hungary. He's in the breakaway. No results really to speak of this year. He annually wins his national his country's national time trial title, which he's held now uh, since 2000. He's unbeaten in, in that respect, but uh, nothing else, I'm afraid, for Laszlo. He's just a very good time trialist, but he's got himself into the breakaway. Back here now, this is last year's winner, wearing number one, Philippe Gilbert. He's being escorted back up to the field by teammate Roy Sentjens. He feels confident too. Obviously, he can't improve on a win this year, but he certainly can equal it. And uh, he's an opportunist, and he's on very good form, and he knows it. No, he is. He's uh, in good form as well towards the end of the season. You can see his teammates at the front here doing a lot of the pacemaking. That's because they feel they need to pull that breakaway back. And they're pulling it back steadily and surely now, Phil, because over the last uh, couple of kilometres, it's come from the two-minute mark to the one-minute 37-second mark. And that's an indication that I think the, the firepower has gone out of that leading group of ten riders who escaped after a mere nine kilometres of racing. Damien Godin, another new name in the breakaway. He's only 23 years of age, but surprisingly, he's in his second season as a professional. And uh, a former winner of the Paris Roubaix Espoir, the under 23 race before he got his pro contact uh, back in 2007. He's a very, very accomplished track cyclist. He's the current Madison champion as well, but he's, he's very good at the pursuit. He's meddled in the pursuit, and uh, he's, a, he's a good all rounder on the track. Well, he's had a long day away in the breakaway today. Well, it's down to uh, 1 minute and 30 seconds now. As Gilbert indicating that he's got great form this season, uh, this end of season, Phil, with a recent victory in the Coppa, Coppa Sabatini in Italy. It's a very difficult race to win, and he uh, led the riders to the line in a very difficult uphill finish. But to win uh, Paris Tours for the second year in a row, what he really has to do is to get away from the main field on the running towards the finish, using those repetitive nature of the little three climbs in the last eight kilometres or four, five miles of the race. Well, of the 103 editions, or the 102 thus far, that we've had of Paris Tours, uh, France and Belgium between them have won 70 of them. So uh, it doesn't leave too many for the rest of the nations. Only 10 nations have ever won this race uh, in any case. But France and Belgium sharing out the lion's share. And uh, France still looking to come back. They haven't had a winner since 2006. Freddy Guedon was the winner then. And Belgium, of course, picking up Philippe Gilbert uh, last year. The United States have never had a podium finish, and that might change today if Tyler Farrar can better his fifth place finish of last year. He's the most likely to succeed. But as far as records go, well, four men have uh, won this race on uh, three occasions, and none are currently racing, so the record can't be equal today. Surveys uh, Carnarvon just going to the front a few moments ago from Team Milram and he is one of those uh, stalwarts of the sport, the, the team captain on the road for Team Milram and he'll be thinking to look after the chances of Gerhard Scholleck, a very fast sprinter from Germany. He used to be a teammate of Mark Cavendish and realised that if he wanted to uh, get some success he needed to separate himself from the Britain, moved across to the German squad last year during the transfer season. Lots of rumours and innuendo surrounding the transfers for next season. A lot of those uh, around the brand new uh, British team for Sky TV. Well, next season is going to be a most interesting season all round with a lot of changes and more teams on the block. Two top teams from France losing their Pro Tour status, which is something of a surprise. Uh, so I think we're going to see a very interesting year next year. Lance Armstrong will continue for one more year and will undoubtedly take part again in the Tour de France before the, he will start to think of other things. Uh, well, amongst the races he's earmarked for next year, in 2011 rather, is the Cape Epic uh, cross-country uh, cross mountain bike race in South Africa, which he is looking forward to riding very much indeed and also the Ironman World Championship, which, which is a triathlon in Hawaii. An amazing uh, variant of disciplinary events. Well, it is, but don't forget when Armstrong started his career, he was two-time American national uh, triathlon champion at the shorter distance, of course, but at 17 and 18 years of age, he was the senior triathlon champion of the United States. And, of course, uh, it's something that I think he would really like to get back into. He is a great runner as well, having ridden in the last three years three sub-three-hour marathons. Uh, an indication that this man really is available to change himself to almost any discipline, whether it's swimming, running, or riding a bike and a mountain bike. A mountain bike, by the way, that he's been extremely successful on this year for winning that 100-mile mountain bike race in Colorado, the Leadville 100, by a mere 25 minutes. Yeah, that's a long way. <laughs> and that was finishing the last uh, five miles on a flat tire because he was too scared to stop. He thought he was going to get caught. 
Well, the Cape Epic, of course, which is uh, run in the month of March, uh, runs along the garden route and down the south by Cape Town there. It is, um, it's a two-rider race, so you're only as good as your teammate, and the big question is who will Lance ride with? And the hot favourite is his new teammate again, Levi Leifheimer, would accompany him to ride the Cape Epic. Epic. But because of commitments to the Tour de France next year, it'll be 2011 before that chance comes along. Big year for sport in South Africa anyway next year with the World Cup football taking place there. Well, those black clouds, Paul, are coming rather close to the nose of the riders now. We might get a little shower before we turn for home. Well, let's hope not because it's a rather tricky run through that last 10 kilometres uh, with uh, the three nasty little climbs and lots of twists and turns and uh, the fact that it has been uh, reasonably dry over the most of today. If it does start to rain down towards the finish line, it's going to make it very slippy on the run in towards the finish in the Avenue de Gramont, the great long finishing straight at 2.6 kilometres, which leads a lot of the sprinters to make mistakes because the finishing line you can see for an awful long time before you actually get there. So at 45 kilometres to go, we're now down to 1 minute and 24 seconds advantage. And I have a funny feeling that they are starting to shut off the chase now because they're trying to judge, Phil, just exactly where they want to catch these leaders. They know that they've got the leaders within their grasp, which is why I think we can see the main field spreading across the road like this, an indication that the real press of the chase has come off for a few kilometres or so before they finally turn the knife into the wound for the last time. Sweeping left-hand turn. 44 kilometres left, a minute 25 a gap. Uh, saying 1 minute 30 on Radio Tour, but we'll go with our pictures at 1 minute 26. It's not going to matter four seconds. Mind you, uh, last year the race was decided by just four seconds. Farrar bringing home the peloton with Gilbert was that much in front. There's a nice view from the rear of the peloton. There's still a lot of the riders here. 191 at the start today, 25 teams been a very very fast race the sun uh, just getting in between those clouds right now on the left side of the riders this is life at the back here as the riders come back with drinks number 206 there is a uh, Jean-Marc Marino a Frenchman on the Besson Chasseur team another team that doesn't normally get to ride the big classic races well, a big oh, crash. Been a massive just crash at the here, back Paul. here a number of riders gone down a case de Pagne, a Francaise de Jeu and a rider from Garmin well it Katusha as well on the floor. Let's uh, see where that crash was. Right at the back in the last 25% of the field. That's an indication. A lot of riders now starting to get a little tired, a touch of wheels, and bang, there's four or five riders on the ground. Let's have a look at it from another angle. Well, there's another view of it, I think. It's the road's very narrow here, but when you're in such a big bunch, that's a different crash, that. And the Katusha rider is Mikhailov. Uh, it's rather sad because the way he sat there, I suspect he's broken his right collarbone. Gerard Porte is the doctor from the Tour de France, also just checking him out. I wonder how many broken collarbones that man has checked over the years. Well, he's been around there, uh, strangely enough to, to, to understand, Phil. That guy has been a doctor at the Tour de France and races like Paris Tours and Paris Roubaix since I was racing, and that's a few years ago. Absolutely, you no. Know, he's been around over 30 years uh, looking after riders. Everybody else seems to have got away and they're re rejoining at the base. This is the front end. Well, this is the front end of the main field, and uh, still Garmin Slipstream very happy to put riders uh, at the front end of the peloton with big Johan van Sommer in there as well for Silence Lotter, a man who will do anything in any different kind of race to help out a team leader, whether it's Cadell Evans or it's Philippe Gilbert. There's the damage done by the fall as the riders try to rejoin here. It's a bit of a tough chase. This caught Andre Greipel out today. He abandoned the race when he never rejoined after a group of some 20 riders were caught off the back and simply could not get back in the winds. And so uh, a Greipel, a race favourite, won't be in at the sprint finish today. Well, the gap has uh, kind of levelled off now at the one and a half minute mark, going to 124, back to 130. But I think the front end of the main field fill are completely in control of the situation. They know exactly what they have to do, and they don't want to catch that 10-man breakaway too far out from the finish because they know that that opens themselves up to counter moves and the chance of a breakaway reforming before they get to the very strategic part of this race, which comes at around about eight kilometres to go when we go into the first serious climb on the run and that is the Côte de Lepon. Long flat roads of Loire here as we now get ourselves back together. A bit of a distraction probably in the chase at a minute 23. 
We are now looking at the leaders of Paris Tour here at 42 kilometers out. They've got just one minute and 23 seconds remaining of a breakaway lead of over seven and three quarter minutes. Now these 10 riders got clear nine kilometers into the race today and now they're just 42 from the finish. And I think because a lot of the work, Paul, has been done by the quick step team of Tom Bonin and in particular by the Garmin Slipstream team of Tyler Farrar. They haven't allowed this break any chance at all. Well, once they saw this breakaway get to an advantage of seven minutes and 40 seconds, the alarm bells started to ring. And of course, the teams who think they've got the favorites on board came to the front end of the main field and started to control that gap. And then over the last 40 kilometers, they've reduced it now down Phil, to a minute and 23 seconds. But don't discount the fact that Silence Lotto also had a number of riders participating in the chase at the front. And that's, of course, for Philippe Gilbert, who just recently won a big race in Italy, the Coppa Sabatini, and he is the defending champion. Quick rundown of the names, uh, Damien Godin. Some of these names will be strange. We don't normally talk about them in cycling. Uh, Damien Godin of B-Box, Matthew Heyman, Rabobank, Laszlo Bedrogi of Katusha, Mathieu Le Danu from Francaise de Jeux, Martin Elmager, A.G. Tuan, his teammate Cedric Pino, Vacon Soleil, Adri Vierhouten, who's retiring after the race today. He's in the breakaway. Uh, Skill Shimano's Tom Feelers, uh, Bretagne's Jean-Luc Delpeche, and uh, making up the top 10 in the breakaway, Jonathan Tia of over 93. That's the breakaway. They've worked very well together. Tia actually tried to leave them at 55 kilometers out, but they've lassoed him and put him back in that leading group of 10. And we've seen this lead come down quite quickly. Well, Team Quickstep are obviously very keen, Phil, to make sure this breakaway does get caught on the run in towards the finish. They must feel extremely common. Com com confident that their man Tom Bonin has got a very good chance of winning. Bonin, the Belgian national champion, recently won a stage of the uh, big race uh, around the, the franco belge part of Belgium and he finished second overall there to Tyler Farah who is on fire I would have to say in the end of this season with incredible victories, three stage victories in the Eneco Tour and of course uh, two stage victories and the overall victory in that race I just mentioned, the franco belge Yeah, now he's got the confidence and no American has ever won this event and uh, that would be another first of the year for him. Uh, Tyler would uh, really feel as though he's had a stellar season. I think he does anyway, and so he should. Yes, he had to play number two to Mark Cavendish. That was for sure in the Tour de France. But this year has been one of tremendous development for Tyler Farrar. And next year, he'll feel a lot better for it. Matty Haven there, he's the reigning Commonwealth Games champion in the breakaway for Rabobank. These 10 riders then, 1.27 is the latest gap. 41 kilometers still to go. Front end of the main field, Phil, extremely organized there. You can see the blue and white jerseys of Quickstep. Tom Bonin riding confidently at the front end of the main field. He knows he has to defend when he comes into the hilly part of the course to keep himself up at the front end of the main field. That's the part of the course where he knows riders like Pipo Pozzato, Oscar Freire may well look for the breakaway too. Frederic Guedon, let's not forget, he's a former winner of this race. Strangely enough, a man in the early part of his career who won the, the great Paris-Roubaix Classic. That's where the attacks will come and the sprinters need need to stay in the first 10 or 15 places, winding their way through the, the forested part to the south of the city of Tours before then lining up for that great avenue, 2.6 kilometers, and at the very end of which they'll be able to see the finishing line. Boys in red here, Silence Lotto, the teammates of Cadell Evans, by the way. Cadell Evans is not racing here, he's racing in Italy, and they're waiting for the final big classic of the season there, which is the Tour of Lombardy next week. And, um, He's watching his teammates hopefully do well here, but they were adjusting their little earpieces there because they're listening to people in the following cars give them instructions. Now, that's something that might become a thing of the past next year because the UCI, the world governing body, are banning the use of radios on the riders uh, in the feeling that uh, they really should be allowed to do their own race and not uh, act uh, in robo robotic formation. But having said that, uh, they haven't announced when this will apply, and I'm wondering if... Uh, if they've got the strength to do it because the riders themselves want radios to stay and so do the, the team management of all of these top teams so i think that's a discussion phil that's going to go on throughout the whole of the winter martin elmer just going out of the shot there he was a former winner of the tour down under in australia and a former swiss national champion that's right he's well known he's a, he has a good season uh, every now and again he's not, not had a great season this year since it, again they're riding a very good tour down under in australia which is in the month of january he hasn't done much since, but he finished fourth in the race uh, this year. But as Paul said, he has won that race in 2007 as well. 
So he gets himself quite fit early on, but uh, then seems to hang on a little bit for the summer. We're looking at the main field here now on the Paris Tour race, 39 kilometres, and uh, building a little bit poor, we've pushed it out to a minute 38. Uh, the, the average speed is over 44 kilometres an hour, and that will give us a very fast finishing time today. No, it will definitely. This is always a very fast race because generally they pick up a, a cross tailwind in, a, in a, an event like this towards the end of the season. I think what's happened at the front end of the main field is uh, the teams have backed off a fraction. They saw that they did the job they needed to do. They reduced that big gap from 7 minutes and 40 seconds back down to uh, 1 minute 20 seconds. And then they felt they had the catching of this break of 10 riders uh, in their midst. And they want to wait, I think, and delay the catch until maybe around about 20 kilometres to go, which is why now... They've slackened off the pace at the front of the main field and they will pick it up again in the next 20 to 30 minutes. Well, for the sprinters, it can't be a more perfect finish, but after all, after first of all, you've got to bring back that leading group and uh, they've started the counter move very early on today, but it's holding now. A little crash has disrupted the chase, I think, as well. And, uh, but most of the sprinters have got their teams working hard at the front now, prepared to sacrifice themselves they do open up their defences though, and a possibility as Gilbert took advantage of it last year, breaking away at the height of the race in the last six kilometres and managing to catch the leaders and win the day. And uh, Tyler Farrar sweeping up for the sprinters in only fifth place and four seconds behind Gilbert. So uh, they know the dangers. This is not a race, although we call it a race for the sprinters, the opportunists also have had their say. And some strange opportunists as well because a former winner of this race uh, was a man who made his reputation in the mountains of the Tour de France and that was Richard Viron who uh, broke away uh, a number of years ago on a long breakaway in Paris Tours and survived down towards the finishing line and got himself the victory. This man Jonathan Thier of Aubert 93 was a rider who tried to split up the leading group of 10 a little while back and as you mentioned earlier some of the smaller French teams have got themselves into Paris Tours this year but in fact uh, if we talk about the Britannia team which is represented Phil in this breakaway yep. they in fact have got the French national champion and they outwitted all of the big French teams to win that with their man Dimitri Champion which is not a bad name for a champion no it isn't and this is a mushroom of course Yes, Del Pesce is the rider for Britannia in the breakaway. He's 29 years of age now. He's sort of coming towards the end of his career. Uh, while uh, Jonathan Tira, well, he's been a pro for three years, the young man who just saw taking a drink, he's actually uh, only 23 years of age. So his future is assured, I would think. One win for him this year, the Boucle de la Soul, which is a, a local French race, and not on the, as far as I know, on the international circuit. The boys in quick step, they've got to put all of their faith today in the champion of Belgium, uh, Tom Bone. I know uh, uh, the Belgians would like to see Tom Bone and uh, just show a shadow of himself here. He said in the week that he's thinking more of concentrating on time trials next year and possibly a crack at the World Time Trial Championship, which will be held in Geelong, Australia, uh, in, towards the end of September. But um, He's still got some speed in those legs. He does know the finish, Paul, because he won here a stage of the Tour de France. Exactly the same approach. Yes, but I think he would uh, swap uh, a lot of his victories this season for a victory in Paris Tour because Bonin knows how important it is for a sprinter to get a victory here on the Avenue de Gramont on what may well be the last time that Paris Tours actually finishes here. And what a way for him to get the victory if he could with the, jer with the jersey of the Belgian national champion on his shoulders. There's big Matt Heyman going through in the orange jersey, as you mentioned earlier, Commonwealth Games champion, a title which uh, he may well have to defend next year in the Commonwealth Games is on at exactly the same time as Parry Tours in Delhi, India. Yes, yeah, so I suspect that uh, providing he has team commitments uh, that he will be able to slip away to uh, New Delhi and try and defend the title he won four years ago. And one has to say, uh, he hasn't won a race since he won that Commonwealth Games Road Race Championship. He's a very, very strong rider. He has no problem holding his place on the big teams. Uh, he's been with Rabobank Bank almost every... Uh, every season since his career started in fact when he's had a different team and he is um, he's a very strong rider but his only result this year really for himself is fourth place in the Ghent Wavergum Classic which incidentally next year the Ghent Wavergum Classic which normally falls between the Tour de Flanders and Paris Roubaix on a midweek Wednesday uh, slot will actually go to a Sunday at the end of March next year making a lot of racing in Belgium uh, but putting it away from the two big classics, so it will become quite an important race, I think, next year. 
Well, definitely, it was a huge race in the past and has got a great reputation. Another one of the uh, semi-classics, which a lot of people uh, deem is a sprinter's race, but in the last few years it's always been dominated by a breakaway of 10 or 12 riders who've managed to get clear on the run in towards the finish line. Still, Garmin Slipstream very happy to come to the front end of the main field and, of course, keep the pacemaking high as much as possible. 118 they're saying at the moment and 35 kilometers left to go these are the faces of the workhorses now for a quick step all trying to drag uh, the race together for Tom Bonin the big sprinter but he hasn't shown us he's got the speed of Tyler Farrar in these sprints at the moment so we'll see well sprints at the end of the season at the end of 230 kilometers are completely different So we're back with the breakaway here. There are still 10 leaders just inside 35 kilometers from the finish. The gap is coming down by the second by second. 116 now as these 10 riders, uh, Damien Godin is the rider pushing on through here, second year professional, followed by uh, Mathieu Le Danu. And this breakaway getting clear, as I say, at nine kilometers into the race. There's always an early break from a high speed. They covered nearly 90 kilometers. It's an amazing distance in the first two hours of the race today. And the average speed currently 44 kilometers an hour. There's the peloton. And it's not going to be long now before they spot the helicopter above those 10 leaders. Yes, uh, going through the small town of Treuil here, which uh, puts them fill at around about 26 kilometres to go before the first uh, of the three climbs in the last five miles of this race. And that first climb is the Côte de Lepon. And that's where in the past we've seen a first violent reaction coming from the main field. But they do need to pull back that leading group of 10 before they get there. Quick step, I think, uh, very keen to go to the front end and do a lot of the pace making but they've got themselves a lot of allies now also team Cervelo test team are sending a couple of riders up towards the front end of the field and I wonder if that's to give a chance to Roger Hammond the British rider on Cervelo test team a chance of a crack at victory because over the last couple of races Hammond has been very close to getting himself a victory yes indeed and he's in the black and white colours of Cervelo this year and uh, He's been knocking on the door, let's face it, getting thirds, fourths, uh, and just not quite getting the kick that will take him across the line in first place. We could say Tyler Farrow's experienced all that this year, uh, but these last couple of months, he's converted all his places into wins. And if you count his overall result in the franco Belge, he's actually had 11 wins this year, which is a tremendous result for him. It certainly is. You can see the anguish on a lot of the riders' faces here as they get themselves concentrated, uh, just thinking about when the attacks are going to start. There's Tom Bonin in the black, yellow and red jersey. National champion just behind him, Sylvain Chavanel. He's a man who could light this race up on the run in towards the finish. Amazing to think that for a lot of his career, Chavanel raced for French teams, but he decided to move across to the Belgian team of Quickstep during last year's uh, transfer season because he wanted to become a one-day classics rider. And certainly he's proved that the change has been good for him. He's enjoyed his period with the Belgians and he'll be there again with them next year. So the blue and white jerseys of Quickstep trying to uh, deliver their man bone into the straight, but always mixing it and never far away from the front of the Garmin Slipstream riders. They were the ones who started the chase down when the leaders got out to seven and three quarter minutes. As you can see now, it's barely one minute with uh, 33 kilometers or just over 20 miles to race the finish. We course our way south now. We have tour on uh, the uh, right hand shoulders of the riders as we go south. Then we return on narrow roads before we break out over some small hills and then turn on to the most famous finishing straight in the world. Sadly for the last time, 2.6 kilometres of the Avenue de Gramont. Well, with that gap now just coming inside of the one-minute mark, Phil, on these long, straight, open parts of the uh, countryside around Tours, the main field will now be able to see the prey that they've been looking for for the last 50 kilometres. Every time there's a straight part of the road, they will be able to judge the distance between themselves and that breakaway group and know just exactly how much effort they need to put in to pull them back into the fold. This is a group of riders they haven't seen since the ninth kilometre. Well, initially it makes for a comfortable ride for the peloton but then they know the pain is only around the corner and now they have to bring it back and use the domestics as best they can these are the leaders again now uh, on the front is Adri Fierhuten uh, who is saying goodbye there is in the yellowish colours saying goodbye to professional cycling this year as he is one of two top riders retiring from Holland including the other one who's in the race is Stefan de Jong who is currently near the front and working for 
uh, Tom Bonham. But Fearhooten has been a very good professional, long career, turning pro back in 1996. Only won seven races, Paul, and yet we've commentated on him very often. He's been in tremendous uh, situations where he's always been strong for the team again, rather like Matty Heyman. Yeah, I think it's also a question of uh, the famous name as well, because uh, the famous name means four pieces of wood, and it's one of those names that uh, has really stuck to us when we've seen him in any, way, any breakaway situation. But just to conjure up a bit of useless information, uh, it seems to be that uh, it's every odd year that this race has finished in a sprint over the last 10 years, because in 2003, 2005 and 2007, the race finished as a bunch sprint while in 2004 <laughs> 6 and 8 it was uh, the result of a breakaway group so are we going to predict a bunch sprint today I reckon well as we race into the town of Eversure Andrew as we head towards the department of the Loire the Parry Tours race has got 10 men still to catch and the gap just 53 seconds Yes, and you can see the front end of the main field. They're still very much under the control of the teams of the men who feel they're going to win this afternoon. Silence Lotto for Gilbert, quick step for Tom Bonin, and of course uh, the American team Garmin slipstream there for Tyler Farah, who I think today has got a very good chance of getting himself the victory. Interesting, Phil, to note last year there was a four-man breakaway off the front end of the main field, and Farah led the peloton home. I wonder if he's thinking about that as he runs in towards tours this afternoon, because for him it's the possibility of getting himself a second classic victory in the same season to add to the classic the Vattenfall classic that he won in Germany in the month of August that was a first for the United States as well first podium indeed and now he's looking to be the first American on the podium here in Tour he is the man to beat if it all comes together there's no question about that he's really found his legs uh, but of course a lot of riders here will try to have a say and it because it the long straight is 2.6 kilometers perfectly straight you have to judge your final effort to absolute perfection because if you misjudge it by two metres, they'll be over the top of you and you won't win. You've got to be a serious poker player when it comes to a race like Parry Tours. You've got to wait till the very last moment to make that effort on the run in towards the finish. And that's what Tyler Farrar is going to have to do this afternoon, Phil. He's going to have to wait. He's going to have to see the challenges coming on the left and the right-hand side of the, of the road. And he's going to have to wait for the exact right time for him to make his move to try and get himself the victory. But to do that, he's going to have to beat riders, of course, like m m men from Spain, Oscar Freire, Tom Bonham from Belgium, real good sprinters. Most of the sprinters today, perhaps unusually so, have been given the number one because this is a deemed a sprinter's race. Roger Hammond, for example, of Cervelo is number 81. And uh, Philippe Gilbert last year's win, of course, carries number one, while Oscar Freire, who's podium three times, but he's never won this race, uh, he carries 101, he's on the Rabobank team, has a man in the breakaway. Andre Greipel, the German sprinter for Colombia, he's 61, but he's gone already because he got left behind. Uh, Tom Bonin, number 91, so they've recognised all the sprinters and given them their, their moments of being the team leaders today. Yeah, there's a lot of sprinters, a lot of people talking about JJ Hayedo as well, who recently also got himself also a victory. Four. So all of the sprinters really are on fire. It's hard to know which one is head and shoulders above the rest. Although the American Tyler Farrow we keep talking about, Phil, has been very dominant in sprinting since the end of the Tour de France this year. A Tour de France which saw him almost get a stage victory on a number of occasions, but he, he just couldn't get himself around Mark Cavendish, who won six individual stages and isn't here to try and win this Classic this year, uh, retiring at the end of the Tour of Missouri, having uh, picked up a chest infection time to sit back and build up for another year he's still a pretty young guy Mark Cavendish so a long long career ahead of him as we look at the 10 riders now desperate moments 40 seconds the gap they know at 29 kilometers out they are not going to survive this breakaway but they're not going to give up either by the look of it as Fia Houghton goes through from the Vacon Soleil team saying farewell in style one has to say a long breakaway today from kilometer 9 of the 230 kilometer race so He's just on in the lead there for about 190 kilometres by the time they get swept up. That's a long way to stay out front. But I think the main field, Phil, were very attentive. Uh, 45 kilometres, by the way, covered in the first hour of racing, 40 kilometres in the second hour of racing. The main field never really allowed that breakaway to get a massive advantage because I think they realised they were going to have to chase them down on the run in towards the finish. Once it got to in excess of the seven-minute mark, they set a false tempo on the front end of the main field. A lot of that work being done by Garmin Slipstream. 
Now, a chance to try and split up the race here. This is going to have to happen, I think, to try and get the people behind to not relax. Well, they call it the race of the, fa of the falling leaves, and there is the autumn setting in here now, but it has been a lovely day, and I'm happy to say the rain clouds which scurried in have just scurried out, and the sun has come back. So it's a beautiful day in Tor, waiting for the arrival of the race. Well, this is Jonathan Tier again uh, from the Aubert 93 squad, trying to get himself up the front end of the main field. But the peloton is now down to 30 seconds, and that's not very much more than 400 metres advantage. So uh, on any of these straights now, the group that are just behind him will be in the sight of the main field. Well, 30 seconds is, uh, is nothing on a straight road here. And once they sent it, they'll try to delay the catch like they always do in the hope that they won't incite somebody else to have an attack. We're starting to get into the ripples of the foothills now as we race into the department of the Loire. As we plunge south of the Tour itself before we make a right-handed course uh, to come back in from the south. This is the first of little climbs, the Côte du Cochu, which takes us at around about 203 kilometre point of the race, which would be right, 27 kilometres to go. These are the leaders now, and ten leaders together as they start the climb of the Côte de Crochu, uh, which comes at just uh, 23 kilometres or so from the finish. 27 kilometres from the finish, and the gap is holding at half a minute. But there should be a reaction, Paul, from the peloton on this climb. Well, the main field uh, certainly will start to pick up the pace, and you'll see that gap by the summit of this climb field start to be reduced, it, and it'll go inside of the 30-second margin. Silence Lotto uh, not wanting to split the race up at this point. They want to try and keep it all together, but the leading group of 10 riders is now starting to split. I expect this is Martin Elmiger getting himself off the front end of the main field, one of the riders from AG2R, or Cedric Pinot, in fact, it is. Pino, he's the lesser known of the two, he's a fourth year pro, but he's never won a race, he's only 24 years of age though, so plenty of time there. As the breakaway now splitting up on the climb, this looks like it might be Roy Sentience here, setting the pace from the front of the group. The quick step rider is another retiring cyclist this year, Stephen de Jong, who I remember when he was an amateur, Paul, he won the first race I ever saw him win as an amateur in the Australian race, the Commonwealth Bank Cycling Classic. I think he won in Terrigal on the central coast there. He certainly did. He's had a long, illustrious career and he will bring it to a closer. He's going to be 36 years of age at the end of this season with 43 victories to his credit. And of course, uh, about a month ago, he won the uh, Flanders Championships in Kulskamp. You can see now a little moves coming at thick and fast. The gap has gone inside the 28 second, uh, the 28 second margin. And these attacks now are starting to come right at the front end of the main field. This had to happen. They've waited for this small climb. They've got the gap down to 30 seconds. They've knocked another two seconds off it. Uh, this is going to be a tough race to control now. There's a lot of riders know that they can't sprint and that they're going to try and break clear of the field if they can here. Well, it's all starting to come together. One or two riders who were in that leading group have already been picked up by the main field. Slowly but surely, it looks as if we're talking here Grupo Compacto, the group all back together. Well, that's certainly Elmiger has come back, so too as Pino. So the ten riders, I think every one of them, I don't think anybody survived out front. If so, they've all come together at 26 to go. Although they're still showing us 28 seconds. So some have survived, and here they are. Matty Heyman still here. We've got six riders. Uh, of the ten riders, so Elmond has gone back into the pack for sure. The Francais de Gilles rider is Le Danu, Vacon Soleil, and that'll be Fierhouten. And the other rider here is Pino, so he still survived. Well, the six riders now will have to start working well together. They're actually circumnavigating the city of Tours. The next town they will go into is jouy le tours which is just to the south of the city, and then where they'll be getting extremely close to that repetitive three climbs on the run in towards the finishing line. It's always uh, a horrible sight if you're in the breakaway at 27 seconds, looking over your shoulder. The whole field is massing here, and it's all the sprinters' men now, isn't it? On the left, we've got La France de Jeu, we've got uh, Oscar Ferrer's Rabobank in the centre. Ominously, I've lost sight of the Garmin boys here. That's a dangerous little left-hander as they start to nip in and out there. But they are all back together. Tyler Farrer is right up there near the front as well, but he hasn't a lot of teammates around him. So too is Oscar Freire, and in the fifth position there is the Italian national champion Pippo Pozzato. Here we're looking at a little bit of um, discussion coming from Pino from uh, AG2R. He's trying to encourage all of the riders in this leading group to keep working together to try and prolong this breakaway for as long as possible. 
Oh, that was Delpash, the rider on the Bretan team who uh, was getting the sharp end of the tongue there of uh, Tier, but in all of uh, Pino, but in fairness, after 200 miles in the breakaway, these boys are tired. And a little time, a small gap opens, it could be the end for that rider. So you've got to pay a lot of attention now. Well, Matty Heyman in the orange jersey there of Rabobank, he'll be wondering uh, how his man Oscar Freire is doing in the field behind. And Freire was sitting right at the front end. Freire is the kind of sprinter, Phil, who could be very attentive on those last three climbs uh, inside the last five miles of the race and join any small breakaway that does form. So they were 10, they're down to just uh, six leaders now. They're 24 kilometers out and they've got 29 seconds in hand. Well, the main field still in the forested part of the course here, Phil, and as we see that leading group of six out into the open, uh, they will once again start to feel the buffeting of the wind against them. Chief Marcus Lundqvist, champion of Sweden at the front at the moment, as they nip round a rather very nice uh, organised roundabout there, and they've all gone round, I think, pretty much on the same side of the road, the wind keeping them over from the left, pushing them to the right, but you see as soon as they sense a little delay now the other workers here launch an attack and again it is Silence Lotto who has done it. We are at 23 kilometers left now and Silence Lotto, the teammates of Philippe Gilbert have decided they've got to close this breakaway down. There's only six of them but the gap is still probably too much at 28 seconds. Well, they're trying to keep it nice and fast now. It's down to 28 seconds. The front end of the main field now starting to show Phil the little bit of fatigue that's creeping in. And look how long that line is now. The tired of riders slipping to the back end of the main field. It's almost like uh, the distillery that is really sifting and sorting out the stronger men from the weaker ones who are slipping to the back of the pack. Another move coming here. This is, uh, again, little tentatives at the front end of the main field. The ideal place to attack here in Parry Tours is to wait, stay in the pack until around about eight kilometres to go when you get that first of the three final climbs, the Côte de Lepon. That is an ideal launch pad to get a breakaway off the front end of the main field. Well, that was Jürgen Rollins who started the ball rolling there, former champion of Belgium. And he's still staying up near the front runners, but he's got a, at least he's in sight of them all to get together now. We've got different teams being represented. The front, Cofidis, who next year have lost their Pro Tour status, and they weren't too happy about that. Uh, as they swing off to the left now, we've got other teams on new colours here who are also launching their possibilities here. Lamprey over on the right-hand side with their very famous blue and uh, pink jersey and they'll be looking to see whether their uh, former world champion Alessandro Balan has got the form in his legs to get out to the front end of the main pack had a very difficult uh, year the world champion former world champion uh, started with a, a nasty virus but he seemed to be coming back onto form towards the end of the Tour de France this year Tête de la course the head of the race 22 kilometers out they're hanging on aren't they 26 seconds is the gap they're down to these six riders now there's the names for you, Heyman, Le Danube, Pino, Fierhouten, Tom Vilas, who's actually on pretty good form, and um, also uh, Jean-Luc Dolpech is the man that's made up those six leaders. Well, they're all uh, still working together, just trying to keep themselves off the front end of the main field, but I think this is really, Phil, question just of prolonging the agony because that main field, they've chased them down sl slowly but surely over the last 50 kilometres. They brought it down from 7 minutes and 40 seconds down to just inside of the half a minute mark, and it's still the same teams on the front end of the main field. Quick step, very keen to get this race back together because they've got a feeling today that Tom Bonin is going to come up with the goods. But to do that, he's going to have to beat the American rider, Tyler Farah. Devin Olsen's on the front there, working hard now to try and uh, keep these riders in touch uh, with uh, especially Tom Bonin. As we pan down, watch out for that black, red and yellow jersey of the national champion of Belgium. Tom Bonin, we have to say, he's not quite the feared sprinter we've seen in the past. He's had an up and a down year. He's won some good races though, Paris-Roubaix for example, the national championship, uh, but he really does need to add a classic here. I think he'd like to get himself a classic victory with the Belgian national champions jersey on his shoulders. This is Steven de Jong on the front as you mentioned earlier, he's the, the retiree at the end of this season. After, after having an extremely long and illustrious career. A number of riders retiring, big names retiring from the sport. We just saw a little earlier Marcus Lovquist, who in fact was offered a contract by Lance Armstrong's Radio Shack team, and he decided after a long career, he too wanted to uh, pull a close to his career at the end of this year. 
Well, I don't think there are many riders would turn down the chance to ride alongside Lance Armstrong, especially as it's certain to be Lance Armstrong's final full season uh, as a professional cyclist at 38 years of age. There are other races he wants to ride uh, in 2011, including the World Ironman Championships in Hawaii and the Cape Epic Cyclo uh, Mountain Bike Race across the bottom of the Cape in South Africa. That's a two-man race, by the way. And it's a shot from absolutely nowhere to being one of the best races in the world for mountain bikers. 28 seconds the gap. They're really not closing in at all now. These boys have got themselves organised. They're obviously the strength of the 10. Uh, the best riders who've still got something in those legs after 209, well, exactly 200 kilometres as we speak, in the lead so far. Well, here we'll give you a chance of the perspective between that leading group of six riders and the main field. That's not much more than 500 metres. I think what the main field Phil is now doing is just judging the catch to what they hope is going to be perfection. They know that in about 12 kilometres time, they've got that first of these nasty little climbs on the run in towards the finish, the Côte de Lepon, which is quite a steep climb at the start of it, and the launch pad for riders like Pozzato, like Philippe Gilbert, to try and get away and outfox the sprinters. Well, 26 seconds it is, it's a painful way, but the bunch is slowly getting in, and at 20 kilometres to go, the sprinters soon, I think, will be starting to lick their lips. Most certainly, you see how the main field now have slowed down, they've backed off, they don't want to catch those riders too early because they know if they do, attacks will come over the top and that will be very difficult to control, especially at 20 kilometres to go after all of the work that's been done by Quickstep, Silent Slotter and Garmin Slipstream. Ooh. But to prove me wrong, there's a nice attack from Coffee Dis. That's a real, they pulled it out, something out of the bunch there as they're trying to open up. This is going to slice into that lead now, another fast acceleration, very, very quickly, riders tagging onto the back. There has to be a very quick reaction here because the rows do get a little bit twisty shortly and we get into these small hills before the final straight where you can see everything over the last two and a half kilometres. 27 seconds and 19 kilometres to go now. Well, we're getting to the difficult part of this race and these riders all know that shortly the violent attacks will come at the front end of the main field and those attacks may well be the attacks that are going to split the front end of the bunch. Jürgen Rowland to gain the strong man of silence Lotto to try and keep Philippe Gilbert in the hunt. Uscatel, Uscardi here, they've been trying to get into all of the moves here. They don't have a real sprinter on their squad, but at least they've sent seven riders to the event as a Pro Tour team. One of the skilled Shimano riders at the front there was uh, from Yuki Beppu, who rode the Tour de France this year and uh, successfully managed to get himself around with uh, another Japanese rider, become the first two Japanese riders to finish the Tour. And that was a, a great piece of history for Japanese cycling. This is the six leaders now, still holding on, Phil, to 26 seconds advantage. But I think panic now starting to come on board that six-man train at the front because they know the peloton are playing with them like a cat sometimes plays with a mouse waiting to finish off the work. Well, we're getting individuals now who are just trying to get away. We're looking here at Ronnie Matthias now, who's just got away from the peloton, rides for the B-Box Boy Telecom team. There's been attack and counter-attack because obviously that gap seems to be locked in at 26 seconds, those six leaders. And sooner or later, somebody's going to have to put down the attack that will count. Quick reaction from the field, as, as expected. And a quick reaction from Silence Lotto. They're being very attentive on the run into the finish. And I think the order of the day is look after Philippe Gilbert. He's on great form. And every time a move goes uh, off the front end of the main field, Silence Lotto puts a man there basically to negate the success, to have a, a breakaway group come back into the main field. That looked like Jürgen Rowlands, who uh, just did the job there for Silence Lotto. He's their man. Obviously, the workhorse at this stage of the race. There'll be others trying to look after Philippe Gilbert or Greg Van Avermaet. Don't forget, Greg is a good sprinter, and if Gilbert can't make it the double, Avermaet will try and take it out in the sprint. I just don't think he's quite as quick as some of the other sprinters in this race. Like Juan Antonio Fletcher as well. They're uh, getting himself across the move. And again, it's all come back together. It's acceleration and deceleration while they wait for the next uh, 10 kilometres because that's when they know the climb start, that's when they know the really violent attacks will come from the big names with the big engines. These are the, uh, the heroic six riders, the survivors of the original break of 10, still all of them working at 203 kilometres. They have been ahead on the race today and they've got 17 left to ride and the gap, unless our clock is stuck, is staying at 26 seconds, kilometre after kilometre. 
It is a quick step once it's again. Moved. De Jong comes straight back up to the front end. He knows that he has to keep this organized at the front end of the pack. He doesn't want it to slow down too much to give that little extra advantage to that group of six riders. Bonin over to the left-hand side there with his Belgian national champions jersey on his shoulders. He wants the win here this afternoon. He wants it to come all together onto the Avenue du Grandmont to have a sprinter's delight. Well, this at the back now is the rider who moments ago was one of the ten riders in the lead because this is Jonathan Thier, the young French rider who is now hanging on for dear life. But at least he's still in there. He's only 23 and a big moment for him. He's a third-year professional on the less and at 23 years of age, of course, a long career ahead of him. Uh, so plenty of experience. But over 200 kilometres he has led today. But he's at the back of the race now. You can see the little urgency now. Everybody looking very concentrated. Hands are fairly close to the brake levers, uh, listening to see whether or not there's going to be any squeal of the brakes as riders take risks to stay at the front end of the main field. But it's always quick step. And again, uh, this uh, big rider from quick step deciding to come to the front end of the main field is thinking only about Tom Bonin, and that's Kevin Hultzman's. Yes, and they look to take a look at the face of Tom Bonin there, Paul. He was under pressure to hold the pace of his teammates at the front. Of course, he's the man with the twitch fibres if it comes to a final kick. Matt Heyman there for Rabobank in the orange colours. He's got a sprinter in Oscar Freire, who has three times been on the podium in tours, but never on the top spot. But he's a crafty rider, Oscar Freire. He knows that he has the ability to go with the breakaways that might form on the run in towards the finish line. And if he can, he could come up with a victory here this afternoon. And now Witt and now Fox, the big sprinters like Tom Bonin. And of course, the man the United States feels has got a very good chance of winning this classic this afternoon, Tyler Farah. Well, we might get a chance to see some of the beautiful uh, chateaus of the Loire Valley here now, which is uh, the race down to the old city of Tour. Very famous cycling city, 21 years the Tour has been, the Tour the tour has come here, but rather this Classic has been finishing here in Tour. And the last time we'll get the chance to see the long straight in the Avenue de Grammont, that's a slice of history, will be very, very sad to see pass away. Roger Hammond's got his team up here, somebody's gone a long way round the roundabout on the breakaway. I think it was Adri, uh, Art Vierhouten who went the wrong way there. Well, he certainly chose the wrong route oh, around there, me. Phil, and he's lost himself about 10 seconds. No, he's this is Via Hout in second place, so it, it couldn't have been him. It must be uh, somebody else. He's going to have to pull himself back up onto this leading group, but uh, at 23 seconds, the main field uh, certainly can't be very far behind them. Now there's the main field. Still very tightly packed together, and if we look up to the top there, you can just see the leading group of six riders. Shortly, they will all be back in the fold. Well, it can't be long now, can it, as the riders are at the same roundabout here. That was uh, David Lelay at the back in the blue. He had a very, very good start to the season. We were talking about him as being a likely classic winner when we were talking of the spring classics in Liège, Bastogne Liège, and he's had a good year. The peloton are a hunting, and the quarry is now just 22 seconds ahead. Around this traffic circle, they're getting uh, very much closer now to the city of Tours and very much closer to the repetition of those three climbs. And as you get into the outskirts of any French town nowadays, you have to put up with the traffic furniture, which makes it very dangerous. The riders now have to be extremely attentive at the front end of the main field because you're twisting and turning, seeing all of a sudden there's something thrown in front of you. You have to be extremely alert. Yes, and this is where we get the sector of the course now, where, as you can see, it twists and turns. The roads are now. This will favour the breakaways. So we'll stay out of sight. Well, certainly not out of mind, that's for sure. We're inside 15 kilometres to finish round that same bend of the peloton. They are dragging this bunch. Same bend of the peloton. They are dragging this bunch along now. There was a big field at the start today. 191 riders. Only Anthony Revar, the only rider not to start amongst the overnight listed. 25 teams and probably six real favourites if you, if you talk of the sprinters, including JJ Haido, the Argentinian on the Saxo Bank team, who races a lot and is well known in the United States. But of course there are riders who would like to try and escape the pack and uh, rob the sprinters of their chance of victory this afternoon, and names that come to the fore are riders like Pippo Pozzata, we've talked a lot about Philippe Gilbert, but why not Alessandro ba Balan, the former world champion? Uh, he lost that title in Mendricio a little while back to none other than Cadell Evans, who put in a sterling performance to finally get the victory that he's been really looking for this season. 
And of course, I think uh, after his performance uh, at the Vuelta a España and the Dauphiné Liberé this year, proved that he is an attacking rider. Uh, it was a brilliant win for Cadell. It wasn't a dry, uh, dry eye in the house in Andrisi and Switzerland. Least of all Cadell Evans, who was uh, who just uh, could not stop crying for what seemed like an eternity, but everybody was very happy for him. And he pulled on the rainbow jersey. Maybe except to Fabian Cancellara, who was one of the strong men of the race. And after his yeah. uh, win in the time trial championships, trying to become the first man ever to win the time trial championships and the road race championships in the same year. Yeah, he spent nearly 20 minutes on the floor, just uh, 10 metres over the finishing line after his brilliant efforts on what was a good day of racing in Switzerland. Now it's uh, the last classic here in France, the 103rd edition of Paris Tour. And 70 of these races have been won by either a Frenchman or a Belgian rider. Next in line is the Dutch, who've had 12 victories. And we're waiting for the first American to step up onto anywhere in the podium will do, as we've never had the America's never had a top three finish. Well, it's down now just a quarter of a minute, the gap, and you, you can see the distance between these two riders. The inevitable will happen. They will get caught very shortly. 13 kilometres to go, unlucky for some, but not yet these six breakaway riders, they are still clear, and it's 15 seconds the gap. We are now into the undulations on the narrow backcountry lanes here as we circumnavigate from the south to head north to the finish in Tour itself and right down the Avenue du Gramont. The peloton, well, because of the size, there's only about eight or nine riders can get to the front and set the pace, but there seem to be plenty willing to do that. Look at this now, the speed has split riders off the back. It certainly has. These are the riders who've been doing a lot of the pacemaking early on. Riders from Silence Lotto, riders from Garmin going backwards there. I think, Phil, that's because of all of the work that they were doing. That was Kylian Patour, the French rider on Garmin Slipstream. And you can see the little moves now starting to come from the leading group of six. This is Tom Vilas of Skill Shimano. But there in the back, you can see the dark cloud uh -oh. of the main field. It is the main field and not the rain because the skies have cleared to welcome Parry Tours home again. Inevitably, uh, it uh, is going to come down, I think, to a sprint finish on this occasion. It's not always inevitable, I have to say. Richard Varonk is the mon man out who won this race after a 240-kilometre breakaway. Although the peloton could almost reach out and touch him, but he got to the line first, and it wasn't a sprint. Tom Beelers, on good form, has having, is having a good season, and uh, Skill Shimano have had a great year this year. Well, it's a team that's always been extremely aggressive. A wild card selection into the Tour de France, and uh, everybody wondered whether they were going to be riding out of their depth, but they were always in the breakaways, always aggressive. And uh, this is a man who's uh, probably trying to ride his team into the history books as well. Amazing to think that this is one of the historic events of the sport. It was first organised Parry Tours back in 1896. Now, Tom's only won two races in his career, and they've both been the same event over different years. The Tour of uh, Shanghai Lake uh, in China, he won stage nine this year, and he managed to win stage five last year. But that doesn't uh, mean he's not a winner, because this man has got some good results in the last couple of weeks, being right in the sharp end of the peloton in the sprint for the line. It's an opportunist move now, and he's pulled out three seconds, 18 seconds, 11 kilometres to go. Yes, but more importantly, three kilometres to go to the climb of the Côte de Lepon. That's a climb that is just at five miles to go to the finish. There we pull back and we should see the front end of the main field. Shortly, they will pull the five riders back, and they will probably know that there's one man just still surviving off the front end of the pack. Well, this is the face of the man now who can't have a lot left in those legs. He's got a courageous heart, though. You've got to say that for him. 17 seconds, the gap. They are coming for him now. 10 kilometres for the peloton here. Tom Bonin has said to the boys, we're getting desperate, lads. And three of them are now setting the pace at the front for quick step. It's official, 10 kilometres to go to the finish for the riders at the back end of the main field and they're still looking for a quarter of a minute to pull back the lone survivor of the breakaway. Vilas is off the front by around about five seconds from his former breakaway companions and there you can see them just in the back there and I think they've decided, Phil, to allow him his freedom but this is a fairly good move here. He's got to survive for another two kilometres then all of a sudden he's going to get that smack in the face from that nasty climb, the Côte de Lepon. If that doesn't end it for him, then about two kilometres after that, he's got the Côte du Pont Volant, the flying bridge. And then, of course, <laughs> of course, the final climb of the day, the Côte du Petit Padin, the step of the small donkey. I must say, it sounds much nicer in the French language. It certainly it? does. 
18 seconds at nine kilometers the cameras pull back now there is the peloton as they reassess the situation Oscar Freire's Rabobank teammate has moved up on the far right far left as we now look at the picture here everybody looking at each other to see who is up here now they're all waiting and uh, the sprinters will all be riding in the first 15 to 20 places knowing that they're going to be attacked on those three climbs of the day and knowing that they're going to have to drag their bodies over and get themselves into the front end of the pack again for the long finishing straight of 2.6 kilometers of the Avenue du Grammont which will probably be raced up for the final time here at Paris Tours because they're going to put a, a tramway right through the heart of Tours and the pedestrian part of the city. And let's, let's also remember, Paul, with the Garmin Slipstream team, uh, Tyler Farrer is without his New Zealand lead-out man today, Julian Dean, and will probably rely on Martin Maskamp, the Dutchman, who does pack a good sprint finish for himself, but he'll almost certainly uh, be the last man to lead out. This is Matty Heyman of Rabobank. He's making desperate bids here. The peloton line up the gun sights now, seeing him for the first time uh, since the ninth kilometre of the race, and we're now eight from the finish. That's five miles and not too far away from this climb and you can see the, the front end of the main field. They really are now starting to realise this is the critical part of the race here this afternoon. You can see how steep the first part of the climb is. There's the main field. They're all over this road and they'll be waiting for the first attacks to be announced by the peloton. And here comes the first attack right on cue here on the climb to try and finish this all off now. This is the silenced Lotto boys who's launched the attack. It looks as though it may well be Roy Sentience who's gone again. But it looks like it's Tom Bonin coming across the gap here. Now he's regarded as a sprinter. He really wants wow. Parry Tours here this afternoon. Don't forget, this is a man who can win Parry Roubaix and he's not scared of the climbs. Now, what does that tell us here? Because Bonin may not be so confident about that big sprint and he's decided he's going to do what the teams would never have expected here to bridge the gap as he has done and he's now gritting his teeth and pushing on well, this is the new face of Tom Bonin well coming across the gap you can see silence Lotto and that will probably be Philippe Gilbert saying well I didn't expect this one I was expecting Tom Bonin to sit back and wait for the sprint the champion performance here by Tom Bonin as uh, he's now surrounded by two silence Lotto riders and the field completely split up the, a few deep breaths required here before they recover their composure and then try at seven kilometers to go we get on to the avenue de Gramont, 2.6 kilometers from the finish and then he's dead straight down to the finishing line well bonan uh, bit between the teeth here this afternoon he's got uh, an anchor of two silence lotto riders on his wheel there looking over the shoulders to say wow Big Tom has got the form here this afternoon as he has created the surprise by starting the aggression on the first of these three climbs. In about two kilometres time, Phil, they've got the next climb and that one, of course, is going to be the Côte de Pont, 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 Pont Vallon. Well, the rider who's tagged onto the back is the sprinter from Vacon Soleil. That's Boric Boschik who's just joined and he is another surprise no one would have expected him to make a move until the last 200 meters either as two sprinters got into the move yeah, but three belgians have got themselves into the move as well and they are all very much prepared to work because philippe gilbert was the man who came across the gap at the last minute there with greg van avermaet a former teammate strangely enough of tom bonan so the three belgians in this leading group of four are probably very much decided to work together because they've opened up themselves a gap of four or five seconds over the front end of the main field but this is scramble time well and this is this is uh, warning bells for tyler farrah here because three sprinters have gone into a group of four and the fourth man is last year's winner so we've got four riders clear now at six kilometers to go desperate moments here now we're looking at Boris Bosic here the sprinter on the Vacon Soleil four riders are clear Philippe Gilbert last year's winner Greg Van Avermaet the sprinter on Silence Lotto he was the first to reach the attack of Tom Bonin we would never have read this into Paris Tour at six kilometres out. Crash at the back. There's a crash at the back here. Well, there's a big crash gone down in the back and it's blocked up the road because these Good roads heavens. are extremely narrow. That slowed down a lot of riders. That will give the big advantage now, Phil, to the breakaway group at the front. This crash probably happened at the back end of the main field, but these riders are not going to see the victory this afternoon in Paris Tour. No, and the Japanese sprinter on Boy Telecom there, Yukua Arishiro, was the rider adjusting his back wheel, so he's lost his chance now. 
Now, who knows if that has assisted this breakaway. Boris Bosic will be thinking of a big win here. So will Tom Bonin. Gilbert's outnumbered. Three sprinters to one just at the moment. But where is Greg Van Avermaet? He's just gone off the bat because of the pressure and acceleration of his own teammate, Philippe Gilbert. He went up a slight incline in the road and Gilbert looks back to say, wow, where's my teammate? Well, there he is. He's just been tailed off. And I wonder if Gilbert now will slow back back a fraction to see whether or not his teammate can come back you can see him looking over his shoulder there thinking come on Greg I need you up here if I'm going to beat these two guys on the run into the finish well he'll have to surprise them he never out sprint them that's for sure they're both very strong finishes I take my hat off though to Tom Bone and taking the bull by the horns here and a sprinter launching an attack like that with about six and a half seven kilometers to go that was a very brave decision wasn't part of the plan to pull across three good sprinters with him, but even so. It wasn't uh, the plan for, uh, I don't think, anybody to see Tom Bonin. Here is uh, the, it looks Pozzato, like, Pozzato, it? Italian national champion. He knows how dangerous these final few kilometres are. And he also is looking to get himself across the gap, probably kicking himself that his former teammate, Tom Bonin, was the man who attacked out of the sprinters group. Now, they've got to watch the motorbikes here. They're getting a bit closer to what is a crucial stage of the race here as Gilbert now kicks again. He says, if anything, his form is better than when he won this race last year. But, of course, they're all watching him now. And Tom Bonin sitting there, the champion of Belgium and the champion of Italy, Filippo Pazzato, is trying to reach them. Well, he's got across to Greg Van Avermaet there. And now he's got himself a lone lead over the front end of the main field. It's desperate moments for the Italian national champion. He is looking to try and join this three-man leading group. But he's got to get himself, Phil, across a gap of about 12 seconds. Just looking down there, this is a phenomenal performance. Well, Pazzato's having his best season for a couple of years with five wins at four kilometres to go now. He leans into this corner, looks up to an empty road just going under the bridge there are Bosic, Gilbert and Bonin. The official time gap is seven seconds between the three-man leading group and Pippo Pozzato. But as we've mentioned a number of times, Phil, this finishing straight is extremely long. And if you start to make tactical manoeuvres on the run in towards the finish, anybody can come back from behind. And that, I think, is what Pippo Pozzato has got in the back of his mind. He needs to make the junction. If he gets caught by this group, though, he will slow. And then the advantage tips over to the three-man leading group. But this is not the main no. field. This is a select group of riders. This must have gone off the front at the time of that crash back in the narrow roads there this is a very very different uh, parry tour uh, to any we've seen for years and years we've had the breakaways get to clear and stay clear for hundreds of kilometers this time the peloton has split up everybody it seems wants to win the 103rd edition well Pozzato will not give up until that group behind him is into his slipstream he will keep riding all of the time because he knows as long as he's got the gap he's always got a chance well, there's a little bit of head turning back in that chase group to see who's there. And right now, we're not sure who is there. But these three are certainly at the sharp end of the race. A very brave decision as they're heading up towards the start of the avenue. At three kilometres to go, the gap of the three leaders is given out at 10 seconds advantage. This is the right-hand swing. And now, in the distance, Phil, they are now in the Avenue de Gramont. They can see the kilometre mark. They can probably just about see the finishing line as well. But it's a long finishing straight one of the longest in the sport well the riders are saying adieu to the longest finishing straight in the world of cycling at 2.6 kilometers that's the two kilometer banner down the road and as they tip over that they're racing across the Loire right now uh, they're really doing this race justice today it's a finish we did not want to see the end of of course but there'll be a tramway a double track tramway right down the center of this road probably by this time next year the sprinters are trying to finish it off in a most unusual fashion by breaking clear. Two kilometres to go. There's the kilometre flag. It looks quite close, doesn't it? But it's an awful long way this straight as we go through here. But there's no time at all for tactical manoeuvring. These three riders have got to keep working together and not think about holding something back. Because if you do, if you start to slow down and lose your momentum, immediately the group behind will come back and catch them. They can't afford to slow down. There is no time. And they keep looking over the shoulder to see what progress is like. Back on Soleil's uh, Borut Bosic is up there. The Slovenian rider who has had five wins this year is a very fast sprinter, including that great stage he took in the Tour of Spain. Pazzato will not give up either. These boys have been right on his back wheel and still haven't shut him down. 
They are trying to get to the back wheel of Pippo Pozzato, but there's no organisation in that group. There you can see the Flamme Rouge. That is the final kilometre. It is such a long finishing straight. They are still working well together. They're really going to have to watch out for Borit Bozic, Phil, because he is a very good sprinter. He too, the rider there in the Vacon Soleil jersey, a winner of a stage in the Vuelta a España. And no Slovenian's ever been on the podium either as he now follows through last year's winner. What a great defence, whatever the result for Philippe Gilbert. The red kite was still in a straight line here. Down the far end of the trees is the end of the 103rd Paris Tours. The sprinters have taken the race to the stairs and they've got rid of the peloton. What a terrific result that is. Gilbert, switch of the elbow there to indicate, come on, keep the pace making, keep riding at the front end of the main field so Buzik comes through. Tom Bonin onto his wheel, now's the time as Gilbert is in the ideal position, but they've still got seven or 800 metres to go. Gilbert, a quick look over his shoulder, Phil, to see what the gap is like. That is Paris Tours, all in the same straight, and the three men at the front have still got this very good chance of getting the victory, but don't slow down and make too many tactical manoeuvres. They can't, that is Paris Tours, yes, but four different bunches. Who would have ever predicted that as they come up towards the finish? As they now are going to have to go, but watch out because they're still plugging away back there, and that is still Pozzato, who they've never got him any closer, he's just 10 metres behind. Now, who's going to launch first? It's got to be Philippe Gilbert, but Bonin, and there goes Gilbert now, and that was what they were waiting for, and Bonin still sitting on the back wheel here. This could be a big upset, but Bosic has got the back wheel of Philippe Gilbert. Now it's Tom Bonin, and is this going to be a brilliant result for Bonin? But, you know, Gilbert, the look on his face, he's going to win this for the second year in a row, and he does. Well, that is amazing. Philippe Gilbert has triumphed over Bonin and Bosic. Now, surely... Philippe Pozzato cannot survive. They've been this close all of the way as Freire comes on the left of our picture. And Chavanel, I think it is going on the right. Well, that's terrific. Fourth place for Pozzato. Pozzato held on there just ahead of Oscar Freire. And this is the rest of the race coming in or one by one here. Completely split up on that run in towards the finish. A great win there by Philippe Gilbert. He certainly was on form. And I wonder if he would have bet himself, bet against himself, beating a big sprinter like Tom Bonin. Bonin really got it all wrong here this afternoon. He crosses the line in second place. Two wins back to back in Paris Tour for this man, Philippe Gilbert, one of the pre race favourites, coming up with a win. And that was the winning move there. Bonin prepared to sit on the wheel of Bozic, waiting for the Slovenian rider to react, waiting for a chance to come out of his slipstream. He had to bridge first to the slipstream of Gilbert, which he did here. He closed down the gap, came across there to his compatriot's wheel, but then he had nothing left to come out of that slipstream as Gilbert made the right move at the right time and had the power to take it through to the finish. Bone's mistake was he firmly believed that Bosic was the winner of the race. He was the one to follow and he gave Gilbert just too much of a lead before he came off the wheel of Bosic, almost knocking him off in the process there, and he couldn't close that gap down and still have a kick uh, to beat the other Belgian rider. That's a great result for Gilbert. Back-to-back -back wins for him. All he said, I can only equal what I did last year, but I think I've got better form. So the result, Philippe Gilbert is at the top there with 5 hours 12 minutes of good race today. Bonin, Bosic, Pazzato, he stayed 20 yards in front of the race for the last 4 kilometres. Oscar Freire 5th, Gavazzi 6th and looking down there no signs at all of Tyler Farah because I think he missed his move out on the hills. Well nobody expected the big move to come from uh, Tom Bonin uh, and Philippe Gilbert very, very carefully watching the move, going across to it and working with the big sprinter all the way down to the finish line and outwitting Tom Burnham with a greatly timed sprint at around about 250 metres to go. So, as we see the sprint finish once again here, Philippe Gilbert gets back-to-back -back wins in Paris Tours. The last two years in the history of this race, finishing on the Avenue du Gramont has been taken by the same rider. I think you'll agree, Paul, this has been a tremendous race today. From everybody here in Tours, goodbye for now.